Welcome to Press Conference USA on The Voice of America. Joining me on the program is Eva Mazriva, broadcaster in VOA's Indonesian service. Hello again, I'm Carol Castiel. Our guest on this edition of the program is Asra Nomani, a former Wall Street Journal reporter and the author of Standing Alone, An American Woman's Struggle for the Soul of Islam. She is also co-founder of the Muslim Reform Movement. That's a new initiative of Muslims and their allies advocating peace, human rights, and secular governance. Asra Nomani recently co-authored, along with Hala Arafa, a provocative opinion editorial entitled, As Muslim Women, We Actually Ask You Not to Wear the Hijab in the Name of Interfaith Solidarity. Asra Nomani, a Muslim born in India and Hala Arafa born in Egypt, argue that the well-intentioned actions by non-Muslims who wear a so-called hijab in the name of solidarity are actually reinforcing the message of political Islam, which distorts the true meaning of hijab and headscarf. Well, we'll talk more about this controversy and the message of the Muslim reform movement with Asra Nomani, who joins us here at the VOA Broadcast Center in Washington. Asra, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Carol. It's so great to be here with you. We're delighted to have you, and I'm delighted to welcome my colleague, Eva Mazariva, from the Indonesian service. Thank you, Carol, for having me. Well, Asra Nomani, for the benefit of those who have not read your article, as Muslim women, we actually ask you not to wear the hijab in the name of interfaith solidarity. What is your message? Our message is that the headscarf is not a pillar of Islam. The headscarf is not a requirement for Muslim women, and it is actually a symbol of an interpretation of Islam that is very political and that seeks to subordinate the role of women in society. And so what we're telling our fellow women out there in the world who think that they are supporting Muslim women by putting on a headscarf is that they are not. They are actually supporting an ideology that sexualizes us and subordinates us and subjugates us. On the other hand, Asra, you're not saying to observant Muslim women who actually do see the headscarf as sort of part and parcel of their beliefs, you're not saying that they're misguided by wearing one. What we're saying is that everybody has free choice, of course. Everybody has the right to wear a headscarf or not to wear a headscarf. That a Muslim woman is actually very observant even when she does not wear a headscarf. And so what we are realizing is that in our Muslim communities around the world, there's either institutionalized forcing of the headscarf or there is shaming if women don't wear the headscarf. And what we're arguing is give women free will and free choice and respect all women for the choices that they make. And what you're saying is there seems to be, to some extent, a misinterpretation. Define what hijab means to you and headscarf. As you mentioned, Carol, I was born in India into a very conservative Muslim family. My mother wore the full-on face veil until my grandmother literally ripped it off of her face when my mother arrived at the railway station in Hyderabad, India, as a new bride. This is a cultural tradition that has been part of our Muslim communities for many generations. But what happened is that in 1979, with the Iranian Revolution and the exportation of a very strict interpretation of Islam from Saudi Arabia, this message got out that the headscarf was required. But in fact, in the eight references that there are in the Quran of the word hijab, no reference ever talks to it as a headscarf. It's mentioned as a curtain or a partition, oftentimes symbolically, like a partition between you and heaven, between you and spiritual enlightenment. And so what has happened is these words in the Quran that have been used for very different purposes are being appropriated for the sake of sexualizing women, including that we have to be covered in order to be publicly mobile. Now I'd like to turn to my colleague, Eva Mazriva, from Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim-majority country in the world. Yes, Eva. Is. Yes. We used to have a free will, free choice, just like what you said, but it was totally changed after the freedom movement in 1998. During the military authoritarian uh, government, it's still okay to implement uh, this free choice of free will. And I used to live in Aceh. It's a small province in the northern tip of, of Sumatra Island where majority of the people there is a Muslim, 99%. But at that time, even I can just still play around with my Chinese friend or Indian friends in the 
church. And sometimes I join the Chinese culture New Year Eve. And, and also they can join me in, in my uh, Ramadan prayer in the mosque. And even my dad, my dad used to be an imam, the largest mosque in, in Aceh. And he never even forced me to wear a veil or hijab. But it's totally different in 2001 when Suharto was toppled by reform action. And then there's come new president with some of the local government, which is really having an Islamic harsh action, yes. How do you account for that, Eva? Why was there this change? Because we know uh, Indonesia is, a, as I said, a Muslim-majority country, the largest in the world known for its moderation, tolerance. What happened? That's what I cannot understand too, because right now, even if you go to Aceh, to Sumatran Island, it's not only in Aceh now, they force us to have this Islamic law. They also force us in the past one year to another 50 local government, where they allow to even stoning a woman if they convict to having an adultery. And there's also one case in Aceh where this 15-year-old girl who was condemned just because he's going to a movie theater without her brother or her father, and then the Sharia police arrested her and then bring her back to the home and then tell her that he says a whore, for example. And then she was hang herself. So I'm so mad and sad with this kind of situation. And they're not just restricting the Islamic clothing to us, but also we cannot take motorcycle to go to somewhere else. We have to go anywhere with my brother or my father. And what makes more sad is that the hijab that I have to wear now is not the colorful one or the one with the motif of flower. I have to wear it black. And I cannot just a short one. I have to wear a very long hijab, black long hijab. Let me ask both you and Asra a question. Do you think this has something to do with the imposition from the outside, from places like Saudi Arabia, we know with the Wahhabi doctrine, which is extremely strict and is very narrow, as opposed to these various interpretations of Islam, whether in Indonesia or North Africa or Central Asia? I'm so moved by your story, Eva, because it just takes me to this community that has been overrun exactly by this ideology of Wahhabism exported from Saudi Arabia. I know Aceh because it's in the headlines for terrorism also. Mm -hmm. The ideology of political Islam is part of the conveyor belt that leads people to extremism. And that's one of the things that causes me real concern because all of the anecdotes that you talked about then on the imposition of not just the headscarf on women, but then violence against them. This is really why I said that the headscarf becomes this, you know, permission slip that we need for public mobility. And this is part of this ideology that Saudi Arabia has put out into the world. Unfortunately, the government of Iran also puts forward this same ideology, but Indonesia being a predominantly Sunni state is absorbing much of that Saudi ideology. And so many of our other communities are. I just brought as one illustration this Quran from the government of Saudi Arabia. So chapter 24, verse 31 says, Tell the believing women to lower their gaze and protect their private parts. Do not show off their adornment. And what the government of Saudi Arabia has done is they have added in parentheses, Do not show off your adornment like both eyes or even one eye to see the way. Cover the palms of your hands with veil, gloves, head cover. You know, they spell it all out because they want us to look like they have forced women in Saudi Arabia to look when they go out, robbing them of their freedom of mobility and rights. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Do you lead a busy life? Not always able to catch your favorite VOA radio or TV program? If you are keen to stay in touch with world news and events, give VOA Podcasts a try. VOAnews.com Visit our website at VOAnews.com to learn how you can become a subscriber to VOA Podcasts. And keep your life up to date. VOA News, your trusted source for news and information. Welcome back to Press Conference USA. Our guest is Asra Nomani. She's the author of Standing Alone, an American Woman's Struggle for the Soul of Islam. She's also co-founder of the Muslim Reform Movement. Well, Asra, let's talk about the Muslim Reform Movement that you are involved in. What are its objectives, goals, and how widespread is it? We are Muslims from around the world who are just fed up of this ideology that's being imposed on our lives as correct Islam. What we are challenging is the idea that 
Islam endorses violence, that endorses violence against women or people who are, quote, non-believers. We are against the idea that you must have political governance with Islam. We are against the idea of social injustice. And what we are for is an Islam of peace, human rights, and secular governance. I bet, Eva, that that was the kind of Islam that your father taught you. Yes, it is. It is. And that's why right now, this Islamic kind of law is also makes my non-Muslim friends is also insecure with their own identity. They don't even make, want to make friends with me because they're just afraid that they will also get into trouble if they hang out with me and go into the movie theater or ask me to join our marriage in the church. So it also makes my non-Muslim friends is also become insecure about their own identity. Yeah, and I feel like this battle that we're facing is is what it is that makes people fearful of Muslims today. Yes. It's been our failure to challenge the extremist ideologies in a way that make people feel confident and secure in this world. And so there's all of this campaign about the so-called Islamophobia against Muslims. But I argue, and we argue in the Muslim reform movement, that we have to put forward the type of Islam that makes all people feel confident and secure and content. And that is what we're fighting for, so that it makes a secure universe for everyone. And it's interesting, uh, Asra, just this past week, there was this celebration or commemoration of World Hijab Day or Wear a Hijab Day, and you refer to that in your opinion editorial. How widespread is this movement, and are you saying to people who, you know, in their hearts they want to show affinity, solidarity, particularly with Muslim women who do feel under siege if they wear a headscarf, they're often discriminated against? We think it's a symbol of solidarity with an interpretation of Islam that most women wouldn't even believe. I mean, if you actually believe that a woman's sexuality must be restricted because she becomes a temptation for men, then you are accepting the assumption that a rape victim is responsible for the rape that has happened to her. And so this ideology goes on to say our voices right now that people are hearing are too sexy for the world, that we would be sexually tempting men by their hearing our voices. And that's how then they silence women. They use Or seeing their hair. Seeing their hair. Or seeing us in the main halls of mosques. This is why we have to go through the back doors if we're even allowed into the mosque. And we have to go in the separate section, sometimes in basements, in balconies. I've had to watch prayer service from a closed circuit TV in mosques because they think that we are too sexy for the main hall. And so what we are arguing is that think deeply about your values and support women, of course, in all ways that they express themselves, but don't appropriate these symbols that are actually very dangerous. That's what I also challenged the, the governor of Aceh at that time. I said, why you always make the rule as if a woman is a sexual distraction to men? You are not allowed us to go out without our male guard, and you force us to wear a black hijab. I cannot go to the movie theater or to the mosque alone with my skirt. I have to wear, a, I mean, I cannot even wear long pants. I have to wear a long skirt. So what is this all about? But well, it just, is about, it, it does seem afraid. to be, it does seem to be about control because yeah. let's say whether you're Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, you are religious, you want to be modest in your appearance, but then there's the question of what degree of modesty yes. will satisfy right. those who say, you know, you have to cover every inch of your body. So one can be modest totally in conformity with their interpretation of modesty and religiosity, but still yet that might not be enough. So that is the problem, right, right. Asra? Yeah, and the problem is when you then use that excuse of Mm -hmm. sexual temptation to deny people fundamental human rights. Because it's in this continuum of logic that you then end up stoning a woman to death because you have concluded that she was a sexual temptation to somebody in the village. Mm -hmm. This is the reason why girls are denied access to schools in Afghanistan because they're too sexy to go down the road to then go to a school. This is why women are denied health care because the male doctor should not see them. And so these are fundamental human rights that people need to think deeply about 
as their value system. If you don't believe in these human rights, then support this kind of ideology. But name it. You know, identify that we believe that, yes, you have to control women. Don't say that you're doing it to honor women or to support the freedom of women. Like, really be very clear about what you're trying to accomplish because it is ultimately about power and control. You're listening to Press Conference USA on The Voice of America. Our guest is Asra Nomani. She's author of Standing Alone, An American Woman's Struggle for the Soul of Islam. She's also co-founder of the Muslim Reform Movement. I'm Carol Castiel, and joining me on the program is Eva Mazriva. She's a broadcaster in VOA's Indonesian service. This is a reminder that our PCUSA podcast is available for free download on iTunes. You can find the download by clicking on the iTunes tab on our website at voanews.com slash PCUSA. You may also follow me on Twitter at Carol Castiel VOA or connect with us on Facebook. Here's a shout-out to faithful listener Jassim Mohammed al Rumethi from Iraq. If you want to hear your name on the show, please send an email to PCUSA at voanews.com or like us on Facebook. Asra, the discussion we're having about conservative or political Islam is reminiscent of of other faiths, too. We see this tendency, even in Judaism, the very, very orthodox, also discriminate against and also, to some extent, repress those women who don't conform to their version of orthodoxy. We see that also in Christianity. So there is a common strain. Absolutely. I mean, there's been nothing more exciting for me than finding my fellow feminists in Mormonism, Catholicism, Judaism. This week, the women of the wall in Jerusalem just won the right to have mixed gender prayer at the wall. I stood at the wall myself this year, and I saw that barrier And I spoke to a woman who is Orthodox Jewish, and she said, you know, we have to have that barrier because women, they're so sexually tempting. And men, they're so weak. And I said to her, wow, you sound like some of my brothers at the mosque, you know, who argue the same thing. And then I walked on the other side of the wall to go pray at Al-Aqsa Masjid, and the man tried to say that my headscarf was not long enough, that my hijab, my dress was too inappropriate. I was wearing pants. He wanted me to look like his idea of what, quote, hijab should look like. And that's all it was about power. But it's Under so the ex- guise of saying that, you know, he wants to protect you, but yeah. it really is a power thing. It is. Yeah, give us our freedoms. And Eva knows this, that in the seventh century, at the birth of Islam, the Prophet Muhammad never required women to wear headscarves. Yes, That's even in, in the holy book, in the Al-Quran too, right? There's no even technical, tiny thing regulate us about what to wear, how to wear it when we want to see our God. Right. So it also shows us that actually it, it was implemented by these radicals or these Islamic Sunnis in Arab Saudi and then try to implement it in, in Indonesia or in other countries too. And we are fighting back. It's 30 years later We should have probably said something more and more and more, but the women in Iran did. 1979, they went into the streets when the government of Iran imposed mandatory headscarf, and they protested. And what did the police do? They beat them up. They beat them up and beat them up and beat them up until they had to retreat back to their homes. And now brave Iranian women are involved in a campaign called My Stealthy Freedom, and in moments of great courage, they take off their headscarf, take photographs, send it across the world, and they feel the wind in their hair. What a fundamental human right that all people should be able to enjoy. We will not that succeed in Indonesia. So many of these feminists in Aceh or in other local government, they were forced out from Aceh. So there's one lecturer, she wants the students to, to learn about this interfaith kind of thing. So they bring them to one local church. They force her to get out from Aceh. So we still not as succeed as the and, Iranian woman. And she probably feared for her life. Yes. Asra, talk about backlash you may be receiving from those who either disagree fundamentally with your interpretation or who perhaps are distorting what you're saying. Well, it's so true what Eva is saying. From Indonesia to the United States of America, we face this incredible backlash. You know, here I'm safer physically because we have the protections of the police, but the response that we got was shocking. And it was from 
academics, quote, moderate Muslims, who were so offended that we should challenge this interpretation of the headscarf that's being forced upon women. And we were called, and we've continued to be called, all sorts of names. Whore is the first one that everybody uses because it immediately discredits a woman in society. We are called monophic. This is a slur in our Muslim community. That means hypocrite. Used to put a target on your back, then it means that you're eligible for death sentence from the extremists. Mm -hmm. And oh my gosh, the ferocity of these blogs that people wrote to try to condemn our argument. And they misrepresented what we were saying to try to demonize us. And so these are the kind of tactics that folks use when they are threatened by their ideology. But we have to persevere. And I, I know that we can challenge this ideology as long as we all continue to do it in all our far corners of the world. Asra, the Muslim reform movement, is that a movement founded and based here in the United States, or does it have branches in other countries? Talk a bit about its reach. Sure. We started here in Washington, D.C. We are mostly American Muslims, but we all come from different countries around the world, Syria, India. We're getting our declaration translated for our fellow Muslims in Indonesia. We just got it translated into Malay. We have a Syrian, Danish member, Canadians. And what we are hoping, just like all grassroots movements, is that people will simply join us. We are not coming forward as an organization or, you know, a nonprofit or anything like that, but really a movement of people. And what's happened is that we have heard from folks around the world who have said, this is what we've needed. We need a response to this version of political Islam that's in the world. We have a change.org petition and a Facebook page, you know, all of the elementary stuff of social media campaigns. And I'll tell you the first thing that we did. We had in our declaration nine points. And in those nine points is our arguments for peace, human rights, and secular governance, like I mentioned. We went and we posted on the front door of the Islamic Center of Washington, run by all of the embassies of the Muslim countries of the world, this declaration. And the country that most dominates that mosque is the government of Saudi Arabia. And we declared at that moment to all of these governments that we are standing up as ordinary Muslims against this intrusion of an ideology that is taking away the great rich tradition of progressive moderate Islam. And do you have men also involved? Oh, it's amazing because the ideology of extremism is most challenged, I believe, by the theology of Islamic feminism. And Islamic feminism is a theology of all people, women and men, and we have so many men. You know, Malala Yousafzai, the young woman who was shot in the face for the crime of wanting to go in public to school, her greatest supporter has been her father, my greatest supporter has been my father, along with my mother, and we stood men and women equal. And that is what I fundamentally believe we can all do in all of our communities. Because a campaign that includes women's rights, but men are too are liberated when we are free from all of these interpretations of Islam. Do you have a website? Perhaps some of our listeners would like to look into the movement. It's at muslimreformmovement.org. Please go there, like our Facebook page, sign the change.org petition. Our hashtag is simply hashtag Muslim Reform, and we ask people to express their interpretation of what Islam should be in this world so that folks from Aceh to India to Indiana can feel that there is an Islam that is one of coexistence and pluralism and human rights, because we, we all want to live peacefully. And that's what we have all struggled to come to this point of really standing up firmly for these beliefs. It's quite a surprise, too, because when Carol asked me to join this program with you, Asra, and then I asked some of my friends in Indonesia, and they said, why don't you ask also other things? I mean, not only about hijab and jilbab, but also about the marriage law, about yeah. the divorce law, because we feel so forbidden with this kind of law, divorce law. If the woman is the one who asks for divorce, she cannot afford to ask for a child support or custody, right? And even if 
in the marriage law. Maybe as I know about the child marriage, where in Indonesia they still force a woman as long as they already have the first menstruation, they can get married. Not because of the thinking development. So they force 15 years old girl just to get married. So many friends ask me, why don't you also ask about that kind of movement? Because, and let's be clear, and Asra, you can probably make this distinction much better than I can, and that is that these types of laws, which are very discriminatory toward women, young women, this is not Islam. But it's being imposed as if it were Sharia law. Yeah. It's a conflation of some customs with Islam, would you say? Yeah, I mean, I think that the mullahs who put forward these ideas believe very confidently that this is a legitimate interpretation of Islam. And you can argue it. Let's be honest. You can argue this kind of interpretations back from the 7th century when young girls were married into consummated relationships, right? But what we are saying is those kind of interpretations need to stay in the 7th century. You know, that was in Islam for the 7th century. And the spirit of Islam was a progressive one. So indeed, we need to come to a place in the 21st century where we have to recognize that adulthood is at 18, that you don't take a 12, 13, 14, 15 year old girl and then arrange her marriage Mm -hmm. to somebody who's so much older. And I am completely with your friends, honestly, because the headscarf is just a symbol of an ideology that is so threatening to women on so many fronts. What Eva is talking about in the divorce issue is that a woman is, you know, allowed to get a divorce if she relinquishes all her rights. That's absurd. In every Muslim community in the world right now, two women equal one man Mm -hmm. as a witness. When I was in Pakistan and I had to do a contract, I wanted my grandmother as my witness, and they went all around the community to first see if a woman could be a witness, and then they concluded that it had to be my grandmother and my aunt to equal one man. I mean, this is not okay for the 21st century. It was progressive for the 7th century, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It was appropriate. But then from marriage, from the bedroom to the public square, these men continue to put forward these ideas to try to control us. Yes. Well, as we close, Asra, back to your opinion editorial, which is entitled, As Muslim Women, We Actually Ask You Not to Wear the Hijab in the Name of Interfaith Solidarity. Now, notwithstanding, this is a well-intentioned gesture by many women and others around the world, non-Muslims, in solidarity with their Muslim sisters. And we acknowledge that just this past week, there's something called World Hijab Day. So what would you propose instead? What would be your message to those who perhaps mistakenly think that this is something positive to do? I want everybody to look deep into their heart, examine the values that they care about, and then stand with the Muslim feminists who are challenging all of these vestiges of control on us in society, from marriage laws to divorce laws to our access to mosques, and join our movements to challenge those ideologies because it's ultimately those ideologies that are getting us into trouble in the world, and so they will do a greater service for Islam and Muslims if they stand with us for progressive interpretations that are really the mainstream ideas of most Muslims, but unfortunately these other people are very well financed and very aggressive, and so we need to be so strong and we need them to stand by our sides, and that's why in the Muslim reform movement we say that we are Muslims and our neighbors because we need our neighbors in this effort because ultimately the way Islam is defined in the world has significance to each one of us. Asra Nomani is co-founder of the Muslim Reform Movement. That's a new initiative of Muslims and their allies advocating peace, human rights, and secular governance. Asra Nomani, thank you so much for coming in and sharing your very interesting perspective. Thank you so much, and thank you to Eva for just bringing to life the real pulse of this struggle in our communities. We will persevere.